Good evening, everyone. My name is Ashanti Carter, and I'm the uh, program manager for the Rodham Institute at the School of Medicine and Health Sciences at the George Washington University. Welcome to our next installation of uh, the Rodham Impact Speaker Series. So this conversation is centered on racism. So we're going to discuss rated R. Racism is bad for our health. So as you know, how we always do it, we provide some announcements and information about the Rodham Institute. So once again, welcome. So please tune in after the conversation for Making It Plain, African-Americans and the COVID-19 vaccine. So this is a two night event where presidents from the four historically medical, gradu medical graduate schools will be talking about um, research and the importance of African-Americans to be involved in the clinical trials of the COVID-19 vaccine. Also, please stay tuned for our next conversation, uh, which will be October 13th. And it's about loving your liver, a non-toxic relationship. And that's where we'll have Dr. Lent Johnson and, um, Diane and Donna Cryer. So a little bit about the Rodham Institute. So we believe in health equity. We believe in social justice economic justice, and legal justice. The founding director of the Rodham Institute is Dr. Jahan Gigi Albayumi. She is a professor of medicine at the George Washington um, School of Medicine and Health Sciences, and she's a wonderful person. And as I stated before, I'm filling in for her. So we have three priority areas, and that includes youth education programming and workforce development training current and future health professionals in applied health equity and community collaboration. Please take a look at our website for um, any information about COVID-19, as well as um, our webinar series and other information. Of course, we have our esteemed staff, Ms. Tracy Bass, who is the Director of Health and Workforce Pipeline Programs. Mrs. Christina Williams, who's the Director of Community Engagement, and I introduced myself earlier. So keep in touch with us. Those are our social media handles. Please email us if you have any questions or concerns. So I'm gonna pass it over to our esteemed moderator, Ms. Julia Collette. I have the pleasure of um, being a classmate of Julia's. She is a doctoral candidate at the Graduate School of Education and Human Development at the George Washington University. So Julia, you'll introduce our panelists. Absolutely, sorry about that. Um, so I'd like to introduce first, Dr. Kevin Henze. Uh, he is a licensed psychologist and psychiatric rehabilitation practitioner. Trained at Boston College's Institute for the Study and Promotion of Race and Culture, Dr. Henze specializes in race and culture-informed clinical and systems redesign practice. He is also a certified psychiatric rehabilitation recovery practitioner. Dr. Henze is an assistant professor of counseling at Regis College in Western Massachusetts and a consultant with the Jernigan and Associates LLC. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Erin Athey. Uh, she is developing a research program focused on the development of evidence-based interventions for HIV infected individuals and other chronic diseases, including mental health issues with a focus on the social determinants of health. Her entire NP career has been devoted to working in under-resourced areas, most of which have been in Washington, DC, caring for HIV infected adolescents and adults. Dr. Athey has a keen understanding of the importance of providing holistic care to patients, which include their biological, psychological, and social needs. 
And lastly, I'd like to introduce Ms. Deanna Cherry. Uh, she began her career as a grant writer, raising over $13 million for anti-poverty and social justice programs. She left fundraising to become an organizational change facilitator, focusing on difficult conversations on race. As the senior facilitator for USC's Center for Urban Education from 2008 to 2018, she worked with numerous colleges, both in the United States and abroad. After 20 years in the nonprofit and higher education fields, she took a sabbatical in 2019 to reflect on the emotional and spiritual dimensions of racial equity work. Her reflections on her own indigenous roots and whiteness are informing a new phase of her work as a facilitator, coach, and artist. She now works with her facilitation partner, Ricardo Vidal, to support shifts in cultural in culture away from whiteness and towards interconnectedness in both business and higher education settings. Deanna received her Bachelor of Arts degree in intergroup relations and discrimination and one in international development from UCLA. She is certified by the Institute for Intergravative Intergra Coaching and is the president of the Adama Foundation. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm going to get started with our first question. Um, so describe how structural racism has been built in our medical and public health systems. Dr. Henze, can you please take it away? Oh, sure. Thank you so much. Well, you know, I think this is a really important question. And racism and anti-Blackness in particular are primary cornerstones on which public health and medicine are built. Um, when I think particularly as a psychologist in mental health services, racial disparities are clearly documented. So compared to white folks, Black, Indigenous, and people of color are more likely to receive low quality care and or more, are more likely to um, end their treatment early. They're less likely to have access to care and they're less likely to pursue treatment um, and less likely to receive their needed care when they do make an attempt to pursue it. So we might wonder, well, how are these disparities happening? Why, why are they occurring? I mean, some of it is happening when um, a black indigenous person of color enters a, a therapist counselor's office. Uh, the diagnoses that are rendered uh, for uh, black folks in particular tend to be skewed. Uh, such that black folks are more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia uh, as compared to trauma. And uh, black men in particular um, are uh, four times more likely than white men to uh, have a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And so we have to really think about this. And, and for me as a white uh, psychologist, I think part of how this is working is that the structural um, racism is um, affecting the way that providers are understanding Black, Indigenous, people of color clients. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about providers. Um, the APA um, shows that 86% of psychologists are white and less than 2% of members of APA are Black. And so when you have a, a workforce that's predominantly white, that's serving a clientele that's diverse, person of color comes into the office that might be experiencing racial trauma. The question is, how is it being understood? And I, I could share a lot more about how I think this is playing out, but I wanna make space for other panelists' responses to this question. I'm happy to speak more though about how I think this is playing out in the area of mental health. Dr. Athey, would you like to answer this next? Sure, no problem. I think what I can offer is kind of a local perspective in Washington DC. That's, you know, most of my 16, 15 of my 16 years as a nurse practitioner and a clinician have been in DC and a decade of which has been really practicing in Southeast DC um, in an area affectionately known as East of the River, East of the Anacostia. And I think for me, when I think about this, this question and this topic, I think about 
sort of myself driving over into this area of town and what I see and what I what you notice. So you go across the bridge into Anacostia, you notice that greater than 90% of the people are African American. You look around, there's no grocery stores. It's a food desert. There are people that are like walking on the streets, not having, you know, jobs, unemployment rates are low. Um, there's dilapidated buildings and houses, and it just really looks like a community that was sort of not cared for and kind of left behind. And then in the hospital itself, so where I've been practicing is United Medical Center. It's the only hospital in this area of town. So it's actually the only hospital that's not in Northwest Washington, DC. Um, and so for me as a clinician, um, you know, and as a white provider to majority African-American patients, I think what I have noticed, and I think as Dr. Hunzi is saying, is a lot of like what seems like mental health issues, a lot of trauma, um, just bad experiences with the healthcare system, really like afraid, mm -hmm. um, feeling separated. Um, and some of that may be because, you know, initially I don't look like the patient that I'm seeing. I think it's more with the history of their experience with healthcare. And, you know, as a relationship develops and as trust is formed, that in my experience has changed, you know, how they come in and, and how relaxed. But um, to me, it's this pervasiveness of just sort of trauma and um, distrust um, and fear. And I think that is kind of how it shows up and what it looks like um, in a clinical space for a clinician like someone like me. Yeah. Thank you. Deanna? Um, I think those are so helpful. I think the only thing I would add is that, um, you know, from the founding of the country to today, there's been a real separation of people into silos. So there's the idea of, um, you know, the agricultural industry um, providing food and, and there are food deserts, but I think also the fact that people's own knowledge of their own histories of using food as medicine, the idea that we had a much more um, community-based sense of care, that there were people within the community who provided the psychological services, who provided the food, you know, and we had integrated um, communities and those have been systematically torn apart. Um, and in the white community where that's also the case, um, we don't, uh, we fare much better because we have access to the, these kind of new and, and, and capitalistic uh, forms of providing services. But um, in communities of color, you know, there aren't those, um, the, there was, there's no access. And it's interesting if you see recent immigrants, their health is much better because they're still tied uh, in many cases to those, those systems of providing food and, and care. So it's not necessarily linked even to income. Um, or, or to race or ethnicity, but it really to how long folks have been in this country and been kind of indoctrinated into this capitalistic system of providing health in a particular kind of way. So, um, so I think it's just important to add that piece of what's happened, you know, over the, over the years. That's really interesting. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next question if you all are ready. Uh, so studies have shown that implicit bias training does not work. Um, so what advice can you give to employers, especially hospitals, clinics, et cetera, about training healthcare professionals? Um, and what might universities be able to do to curtail the problem of students becoming jaded and thus perpetuating the discrimination? Um, Dr. Athey, I'm going to have you start. Yeah, so um, that doesn't necessarily surprise me. Um, I think when I think of implicit bias, it's these like snap decisions that you make, you know, when you meet someone for the first time, these things that you learn in childhood when you're watching, you know, cartoons and you're reading books um, and you're, you know, you're making these sort of, your brain is making these snap decisions. So um, that doesn't surprise me that it's hard to change I, or to change that piece of it. I think my advice and sort of the way I feel about it is that we're all, you know, as, as a clinician, I walk in and, and maybe I have certain biases, but it's the awareness that you build around that, right? So it's the sort of learning of yourself and your self-reflection of, okay, what is this bias that I'm bringing? And, you know, how can I take a moment to step back and see how I'm bringing that into the space um, with a patient or with another person I'm in that experience. And I think it's that sort of awareness and that sort of self-reflection that needs to happen. Um, 
because it doesn't necessarily have to be your action, right? So it, if, if you have this coming in and you have this feeling or um, whatever that is, it doesn't have to be something that you act on. Um, in terms of training at a university level, so I'm you know at the School of Nursing at GW and we're, we're really kind of moving in this direction. I'll say when I was in school and training, we never got any of this. This wasn't even a topic that came up. Um, it was just really focused on clinical aspects of taking care of patients. And this was like, you know, everything learned on the job for me. Um, but I think the training and sort of the understanding and even some of the tests, you know, for implicit bias, so kind of learning, you know, what your preferences are, even if it's something that um, maybe even hard to learn about yourself, just to sort of know that going into situations and then really sort of training students to sort of be aware of this as they move into you know, practice fields. And that's, we're, we're working on that now. I think it's, it's hugely important. Yeah, thank you. Um, Deanna, would you like to approach uh, this next? I think one of the challenges with implicit bias training is it's often provided in a vacuum and it's often the first training that someone gets. It's kind of become popular as a, a beginning because it's it makes bias seem a little bit innocuous, like it's unconscious, we're not responsible for it. So I think that it's the wrong point of departure. It's a piece, but I think that really we need to begin with the history. Um, most of us don't understand the history of the country and the systematic explicit bias and the kind of ways in which policies have been put in place and um, to, to brutalize indigenous, black, uh, Latinx and, and other communities, Ch the Chinese community. So I think that in integrated into the medical uh, education system needs to be an understanding of, of the history of, of the country. And so, um, you know, we work with lots of folks across the country and, and they, don't, they don't know the history, even if they're um, higher education professionals, right? So I think it's the wrong part, point of departure. So that's the first thing. Um, and then the other reason it doesn't work is because um, if there's no accountability when someone experiences bias, then there's no motivation to remediate one's own practice. So I think we have to bump up um, both the formal and informal systems within the medical field and in all fields where practitioners are held accountable. So if someone makes a complaint of bias, um, there's an immediate response and that it's a constructive response so that folks are having an opportunity to improve and that there's strong feedback loops and that there's some sense of repair for that patient or, or that student. Um, so yeah, I think it's a point of departure issue. And then I think it's an account, largely an accountability issue. Um, and then within a, the right context, implicit bias training can be really helpful. Yeah, I think that if your bias training is palatable to the oppressor, then it's probably not really doing its job, right? Um, Dr. Henze, do you wanna take a stab at this question? Yeah, I, I wanna just, uh, piggyback off what Deanna was sharing. I, I think that uh, it for sure is the wrong place for departure. I think what we are talking about is the need for developing internal systems that cultivate um, racial consciousness of healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. and what And that includes the history of racism and white supremacy in the United States and in the ways that this has played out in policies and healthcare over time. And that, that is countercultural to set up those types of systems. Usually when those systems are established, um, um, if, if they truly are being effective, the system becomes anxious about them and finds ways to discredit them and defund them and close them down. So it is really hard to set up training and not just training, but cultural change within institutions that prioritize racial consciousness. So what would it look like if a system was able to tolerate the anxiety? I think it might look like establishing I hate to say it, required weekly racial affinity groups for staff in which they look at their own experiences of socialization and understanding their history and understanding their own racial identity and working to acknowledge and process that and reimagine what it's 
what what it can be to be an anti-racist white person. And I'm intentionally speaking about white people here because many of the, if not the majority of healthcare providers who are in doctor positions, NP positions, psychologist positions are white identified. And, and so we have to be talking about how are we recognizing and challenging and reimagining whiteness in these institutions. If we're not talking about that, in my humble opinion, I just don't think it's going to work. So I also think it might look like establishing a race and healthcare grand rounds in which, in which a black indigenous person of color patient their experience and navigation of the healthcare system is unpacked through a racial lens. And when disparities are found, actions and restorative justice is taken. It means looking back what has happened in a healthcare encounter. Their grand rounds exist already patient-centered grand rounds, I've been to them. Rarely, if ever, the ones I have attended are truly looking at the client's experience in terms of race. They might say social determinants of health, something that's, that is sort of a distance. It's a, I think social determinants of health are, is valid. There are more social determinants of health than race, for sure. It's just notable that um, in many of the institutions in which I've practiced, it's much more comfortable for the mostly white practitioners to talk about non-racial social determinants of health. And again, I think that links right up into maintenance of white supremacy. So we have to start talking about whiteness and we have to prioritize systems that encourage people particularly white folks, to develop their racial consciousness. Yep, thank you for that. Um, Sorry, I'm muted. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question um, is, there have been attempts in the past to include extreme racism in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM, as a mental illness. Uh, yet these attempts have yet to be unsuccessful. Why is that? And why is it acceptable? Yet we know if one is diagnosed with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, they would be treated under a doctor's care. Why can't we treat racism? Dr. Henze, I'm gonna have you start with this. Oh goodness, <laughs> okay. Well, I, I'll provide some of the history of this. So there have been at least two attempts to um, uh, advocate to the American Psychiatric Association to include extreme racism or a variant of it as a diagnosis in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. The first of these attempts happened in the late 60s by a Dr. Alvin Prasant, who is a professor of psychiatry emeritus at Harvard Medical School. He and some colleagues um, uh, went to APA and advocated for the inclusion of a, um, a delusional disorder, uh, prejudice type, which would really focus uh, be applied to people who are um, have delusions of racist nature um, against uh, people of color and might act on those in violent ways. The second attempt was more recent. A uh, Dr. Carl Bell in um, 2002 appealed again to APA to attempt to include it, and what he wanted to do was include extreme racism um, as a, a type of underlying, a trait of an underlying personality disorder. And both of these efforts were rejected by APA and American Psychiatric Association. So you might say, well, why, right? It's, it's, isn't extreme racism crazy? 
right? It, it has to be. I would never do that. I must say, I think it's really compelling as a white identified person, it's really compelling for me to look at extreme racist and say, I am not that, right? I know I'm good because I am not that. And this was one of APA's arguments actually was that racism is, is sort of woven into our culture that all white people are exposed to this through socialization. And so it's, it's too ubiquitous to diagnose. That was one of their pieces. They also were concerned that there's not good research evidence to support the diagnoses. And also um, many mental health diagnoses as, as mental health providers, um, we're looking for how is it adversely impacting the functioning of an individual, vocationally, socially, relationally. And what we see is that there are many white folks who hold extreme racist beliefs and even perpetuate racism and extreme racism that lead highly functioning lives. Now you might say, well, why is that? It's culturally aligned. The racist actions or beliefs map onto the culture. And so this is the problem. And, and I would add, um, there's been a lot, there's actually a great book that I'd recommend by Drs. Gilman and Thomas called Our Racist Crazy. How prejudice, racism, and anti-Semitism became markers of insanity. I won't go into all of the history that they have in that text. But one of the things I found very compelling as I was reviewing their work is that the authors really came down on the decision that it is not helpful to, to um, call racism a mental health diagnosis because it undermines the accountability that white folks need to have for their actions and for the beliefs that they hold. I could say more about this, but I, I'm eager to hear from my co-panelists. I'm happy to chime in more if needed. Deanna, do you have any thoughts on this question? Um, you know, I just, going back to kind of the, the, the diagnosis paradigm, and the idea that, and, and I'm not saying that anyone proposes this, but it just, it strikes me that schizophrenia is a diagnosis. Um, and we often get hyper-focused on the physical and mental dimensions of that diagnosis without, um, and, and most recently I've been working closely with someone who has that diagnosis and, and recognizing how the system engages them around the physical, the medication and kind of the, the litany of things that the system does without ever really taking into account the emotional and the spiritual dimensions. And more recently in studying with people who have an indigenous approach to treating both drug addiction and schizophrenia, seeing that their primary lens is a spiritual lens and that they see it as a breach in the community and that the only way to heal is to heal those illnesses in community. And so, if we were to take a similar approach to racism, I think we would find it would have a different kind of um, remedy and that we would see it as really, this is a, as this is a dearth of spiritual maturity, you know, it's an emotional maturity as much as a mental condition or physical condition. And so I, and I think it gets healed in community. Um, so I think that there's something to be said for just revisiting this whole idea of diagnosing things and what we do with the diagnoses and more broadly. And then, you know, more, more recently it's become, uh, important to look at the structural dimensions of racism as the primary lens and then the individual or interpersonal as a secondary lens, because there was so much focus on the interpersonal racism for a long time and the recognition that you can fix these individuals who have these racist notions and then you know the system persists 
And so um, I think that's another reason why it might not be a place to put a lot of energy um, at the moment because, you know, it takes us away from the larger social project. So, but I don't know, we haven't done it yet. So we'll see, let's see if it ever happens. <laughs> right now it's the norm. So I don't think it can be seen as a diagnosis. Sure, thank you. Uh, Dr. Aki? Yeah, I don't have, I mean, I, I think what Deanna said was, was actually right on. I think like from the community perspective and not and taking it sort of out of an individual diagnosis, I, I don't, I don't see that as being effective, particularly. Um, but yeah, I feel like she said it very well. So I don't have anything really to add. All right. Thank you. Um, okay, so our next question is, uh, what examples of institutionalized racism have you observed as a health professional? And how does that make you feel as a white health professional? Dr. Athey, you want to take it away? Um, my experience mostly is just seeing the lack of things, um, you know, in the in the hospital system that I work in, the lack of resources, the lack of specialty providers. Um, it, to me, you know, there are definitely patient experiences that have been reported to me, you know, not getting proper pain medication, not getting, you know, proper services, going through the emergency room, feeling, you know, that someone was treating them in a different way. Um, but I think the most sort of frustrating piece is just, it feels like there's just no attention to, you know, some of these needs that across the bridge you can get so easily. Um, and I think that is the biggest thing that I see um, in the community that I'm working with is just sort of the lack of, of access to things. And, um, and of course, there's always the reports of, you know, bad experience and is those types of things that I mentioned before. Yeah. yeah. Deanna? Um, I'll just take one little part of this. So there's a, a notion um, called administrative violence um, that was introduced to me by the Southern California Library for Social Science Research. And it's the idea that to access any kind of institutional care, you have to fill out these myriad of forms and then you have to fill them out again. And then you have to fill them out again. And then you have to go over here and fill them out again. And in order to even get access to the forms, you have to have things like identification. And to get identification, you have to have birth certificates. And to get and so if you've been institutionalized in a hospital for long periods of time or in um, in uh, you know jails or prisons, you're not likely to have um, the kind of entryway documentation that will allow you to have the secondary level of documentation that goes on and on and on. And um, so, you know, for me, that, that ties very closely to restricting access, you know, to anything that is as mundane as, you know, um, a hotel voucher or, you know, kind of simple things um, that provide the basics like, you know, housing or um, EBT. I mean, there's certain things where they've made adjustments to provide greater access, but you need to have, you know, an address. You need to have lots of things to get things. And so for me, all of that ties very well into institutionalized racism, because if you're not an unhoused person or a person who's been, spent a lot of time in, in institutions, you're unaware um, of how prohibitive it is to get the social safety net that is in kind of, it's in theory designed for folks who don't have access um, through their jobs or other things, but in practice, really is largely, I would say, for in my experience, 80% inaccessible um, for the folks who actually need it. And this came up most recently with COVID, you know, where we had in Los Angeles, um, hotels set aside for folks who were unhoused and needed access to housing for COVID. And, um, you know, there's been lots of discussion about that, but um, actually getting placement, you know, it took one gentleman, and this is a slightly different setting, but I think four months, you know, once he'd been approved to get access to housing he'd already been approved for because of this administrative violence component. So, um, yeah, so I just think that feels very bureaucratic and it is very bureaucratic and I think the bureaucracy works, um, you know, in, a, in this way to violate. So I started an Instagram called Death by Paper. So anybody has examples, go to Death by Paper on Instagram, you know, and um, you can share your stories there. Thank you. Dr. Henze, 
Oh, I love the death by paper Instagram. I'm going to have to share that with friends. And um, I have to say that one of the groups that's most near and dear to my heart's are, uh, at heart is our veterans of the U.S. military. And as I think hopefully all of us on the panel know, the federal government offers uh, veteran disability benefits through the Veteran Business Administration uh, for veterans who've experienced service-related injuries. And there has been some past research, and I would say it's been past research, but it's demonstrated that Black veterans are less likely to receive comparable rates of service connection when compared to white veterans, particularly when you look at the service connectedness for post-traumatic stress disorder. And she might say, well, what does this really mean? This is not, this is not, not a, a small deal, it's a big deal. So a single veteran who receives a 70% service connection rating currently in 2020 receives four, uh, $1,400 a month tax-free. If their rating is 80%, they receive $1,600 a month. However, if their rating is 100%, they receive $3,100 a month. They receive health care benefits, access for their family and dependents. They receive uh, dental care, and they're able to tr um, have educational benefits of some sort for uh, dependents. So this is a huge difference between 80 and 100, right? It's thousands of dollars. Access to healthcare, it's monumental. And um, you can surely find black veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder who are awarded 100% and have that. But the fact that a racial disparity has been documented, in my mind, highlights another way that Black people are disenfranchised by white supremacy. It, it should not be the case that there is that difference. So what's my reaction? Because that was part of the question. I get angry. You know, and it motivates me to consider how can the structural racism within organizations, including the Department of Veteran Affairs and Veterans Business Administration, how can these systems be challenged to be better? And I'll say, challenge is not without consequence. As I was doing some research for this panel, I have to just give a shout out. I found an interesting and excellent blog called the Veterans Law Blog. It's veteranslawblog.org. Please note, you have a couple free blogs you can access, then you have to pay to have access. But there was this excellent blog written by, uh, entry written by uh, Chris Atig uh, called The Systemic Oppression of Black Veterans. And what he documented was that in recent months, um, he had posted on his blog about um, the experience of Black veterans and received such a pushback from other members of this blog, mostly white members. And um, I won't give away all of the details about the blog entry, but in, in when I read this, I was heartened that Chris Atig, a white man, did this and actually is now in the process of hiring a black identified writer for the blog and prioritizing. He's working to change the structural racism in his own organization, right? But again, without, there are consequences. People are falling away from the blog. And so I, I share all of this because these examples of structural racism that we see in healthcare I think it's easy to do research on them. I think it's easy, it, it can be easy to identify the disparities. It's much more challenging to engage the system in meaningful ways that result in rectifying these wrongs.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so our next question is, uh, how does racial discrimination affect our health? And why is it important that we discuss the racial divide in terms of health and healthcare? Deanna, do you wanna start us off with this question? Um, I'm just going to take it from the lens of when we're trying to do the work of remediating um, some of the practices of, and from where Kevin left off, which is that white folks leave, right? There's white flight from whatever spaces become kind of um, declared as spaces where these conversations can happen. So, um, so we have this fight or flight or freeze reflex, right? And, and when you do the work in trauma, there's lots of conversations about fight or flight. And racial justice work or even conversations, putting it on the table, it activates most people's fight or flight. Um, whether you're a person who's been subjugated to a lot of oppression or even some oppression, um, or you're a person who's identified with the oppressor and has been part of the process of oppression and, or, and benefited from oppression, um, we go into kind of survival mode. So we get all the information gets stuck right here in our lizard brain. We don't think, we're not able to have kind of reasonable conversations. And so um, in terms of, you know, what do we do with that? If we're running an organization or participating in an organization and we want to bring these things to the table, we want to address it. And like you said, Julia, you know, um, if the conversations are catered too much to white fragility, there may not be very productive. So how do we navigate those spaces? So what, what, my facilitation partner, Ricardo Vidal, and I have been exploring is how do we begin in a process around our mutual wellness that, that really our objective in all of this work is that we be well and that we are interconnected. COVID is teaching us that. The global warming is teaching us that. Like ultimately we have a shared future. And that if we take that as our point of departure, that we're interconnected and that it's important for us to care for one another's wellness and then we practice the things that we know settle our nervous system, like breathing and taking a few deep breaths before we enter into these conversations. Or there's all kinds of things you can tap, you know. Um, you, we did, I didn't mention last time about how does it make me feel as a white practitioner. I mean, I feel incredibly frustrated the closer my proximity is to the problem. So when I am with someone navigating the system and I'm having to sit for eight hours in a clinic waiting for medication for the second time, you know, and this is a whole day I'm losing from my life, um, I'm incredibly frustrated. But in the midst of that, right, I, I know that I'm developing empathy. Um, for the people who do that and it's their norm. So I have to settle myself in that. And then I choose to use that anger um, and uh, to, to create art, right? So art is another avenue that we don't in our culture often think of as part of this work and that all of us are artists in some way, shape or form and that we need to find our voice. So art, settling our nervous systems, right? And recognizing that as white practitioners, it's incumbent upon us uh, to, to do the lion's share of the work, even though we don't have um, the, sometimes the insight that we need. And so we have to be extraordinarily humble um, and open to feedback. So it's a complex set of skills that we're cultivating. And I think that um, if first and foremost, you can settle yourself and learn how to do that, then you can proceed to do the other pieces. But if you don't ever settle yourself and you're in fight or flight all the time, you're not gonna be able to connect with people who are having a lived experience. You're not gonna be able to connect with other white people. You're just gonna be kind of in a woke kind of pantomime. <laughs> Frustrating yourself and everyone else. So, and I know that personally, cause I, I do it and I've done it. So I'm not saying uh, I'm beyond it. I just think that's my learning, you know. Yeah, thank you very much. Dr. A.B. Yeah, so I think in terms of um, why discussing the racial divide in terms of health and health care, I don't know, and this may seem very basic, but I don't know that a lot of practitioners, at least that I know in my spheres, like actually make this connection on a regular basis. I think that, you know, again, depending on your level of training and education and experience, I don't know that there's always the connection to certain things. And um, I think, you know, when Deanna was talking about sort of this like trauma and these like little like little T traumas that people endure that lead to stress. And I think a lot of the, the patients that I've seen would talk about, you know, instead of feeling 
like a, they have a mental illness or depression or something, it would be the stress that they carry, like the daily stress and that, that really impacts health. I don't think that people know that necessarily, right? That that really does impact health over time and that these daily microaggressions and little t traumas that people endure really do impact health. Um, and then I would say also that in, you know, in the space that I work, um, you know, the social determinants, I know this is something that is coming up more regularly now, but I don't think that was always something that was like a known thing to clinicians in their training. So I think realizing that, you know, you could have asthma by ver just by where you live, just because you have cockroaches in your apartment or you have, you know, mold growing that can cause you to be ill. And that is happening in this community that is isolated from the rest of the city and these types of things. So I think just having those kind of basic conversations about like, this is this is how things go and kind of looking at like a root cause analysis of things and how they become um, and how they make people sick. I think that's kind of why it's important and, and where even though it seems probably to everyone on this panel very basic, I think that's still a conversation that needs to be had with, with folks that aren't in this space doing this work. Right. I mean, it's like the everyday practitioners that are out there practicing and don't have this information um, that don't even make these connections regularly. So I think that's to me, that's kind of where you start is, is at a basic level, just understanding these things, because I think as a white person, too, and, and they say, like, when you're the privileged person, you're just a fish swimming in a bowl. Right. You're just you don't see these things. They don't become apparent to you until you um, experience them or you get in, you know, you practice in an environment that this is every day. So it's very hard for people to make those connections um, until we really start spelling it out for people and especially practitioners. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Henze. Yeah, I'll, I'll take on the part of the question of how racial discrimination affects our health. You know, um, it's already been mentioned, um, racial trauma or race-based traumatic stress. And that's a primary way that racial discrimination affects the health of a black indigenous or person of color of folks. And I think it's important to know or remember that racial, uh, there's a dose sort of response um, phenomenon that goes on, the more that a person is experiencing racial discrimination, the, it accumulates and the, the impacts grow. And that uh, race-based traumatic stress, uh, as is, was, uh, Dr. Athi uh, was mentioning here uh, earlier, right, was understanding it's not necessarily a diagnosis, but stress, you know, it's, 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 uh, not actually considered a mental health diagnosis, it's considered a mental injury. That's how race-based traumatic stress is understood. And uh, race-based traumatic stress is also vicarious. And so we can understand, you know, when you, uh, 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 black folks um, are, or others are viewing um, the uh, killing of, uh, black folks at the hands of law enforcement personnel, even through Facebook or on, you know, video feed or through television, that is, that is stressful. That's traumatic. And it has an impact. So oftentimes the uh, race-based traumatic stress, um, the fight or flight um, phenomenon that Deanna mentioned is surely part of it. Uh, folks can have nightmares. Um, flashbacks and re-experiencing of their own experiences of, of racism and discrimination. They might notice um, being hypervigilant, changes in their mood, um, avoidance behaviors, avoiding actual places. And this happens already. I have a number of black identified folks who talk about co having conversations about where are we going? Where are we traveling? What restaurants are we going to? Is this a safe place to go? And um, I think for white folks, the way that affects white folks' health, I really appreciated, Deanna, your, your commentary earlier about interconnectedness and spirituality. And, and um, there is an inherent disconnection 
uh, that is part of white supremacy because it is a it's a very it's a dehumanizing project at its core and most white folks i know like to think about themselves as a good person as someone who cares about other others and this is part of the reason why that when white folks encounter racism and are uh, are unable to turn it into something else they oftentimes feel very shamed and guilty and that white flight phenomenon that Deanna mentioned uh, can happen and so how does it affect white folks health well i think you see a lot of avoidance of engaging the work you see a lot of um avoidance of having meaningful conversations that would uh, challenge and facilitate one's white racial identity development and i i want to underscore that um as a psychologist i really firmly believe that you know uh, white racial identity is a you know psychological phenomenon it matters and um needing to really tend to the development of a healthy white racial identity one of the ways that white supremacy uh, works is that it really immobilizes white people from engaging in that work um not permanently because there's plenty of examples of white folks who are and have engaged in that work but white supremacy makes it very hard to engage in uh, racial consciousness work among white people. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we got a question in the chat box that I will read to you all. Um, and so it states, the recent reports of a nurse, Don Wooten, the whistleblower, who stated that a Georgia Immigration Detention Center's racist treatment and sterilization of women from Latin American countries was appalling. What can providers who witness injustices in healthcare do to stop the madness without losing their jobs? Dr. Athey, do you want to start with this? I'm muted. Um, about losing their jobs. I think just speaking honestly about it and speaking from the heart and, and you know, um, losing your job, I don't know. I mean, that's, where do you work? Um, I'm not sure. I think that, you know, when you see and hear injustices and, and things of this nature, you just, that's part of the work is to speak up and say something. Um, and I don't, have an exact answer to that and I don't know what that means for that you know individual where they work but I would say um it's it really is about being kind of brave to speak up and say something sorry I don't have a better answer I'm not sure Deanna I mean I always ask all my clients see how close are you to quitting you know how how, how attached are you to this job because the, the less attached anyone is to the job, the more work we can do. So that's a question everyone has to ask themselves. Um, I've done, I've had lots of jobs. I've tried to reform institutions from the inside. I've failed miserably at every turn. Um, institutions aren't built that way to be um, reformed from the inside. I've worked for the last 20 years as a consultant, also very difficult from the outside. So I think that, um, I, I, going back to what Kevin said, I mean, I think that white people in this country and across the world are, we're, we are truly fighting for our souls. You know, we have not uh, been whole for a very long time, ever since we took on the enterprise of colonization and murdered millions of people. So if we want to be whole, it's going to take more than a good job and a, a roof over our heads and all of those things that we think give us safety. We're going to have to be willing to sacrifice um, and we're going to have to be willing to leave jobs where people are being harmed um, because the longer we stay in those jobs, the more we're covering up for the systems um, that are doing the harm. So, you know, I've always liked the idea that we create a collective like a union and that we put in our dues and when people are um, need to leave their job, they get to tap into some collective support um, because there's not going to be an easy road. And if we stay in this fight as individuals, it's going to be even harder 
So we're going to have to figure out a way to find each other and support each other, whether it's emotional support um, or figuring out how to um, make realistic plans, because I recognize what I'm saying is, is extremely difficult. And, you know, I have left jobs, you know, I have left many jobs. Um, and the other thing is when you're doing good work, and you really want to make a difference, I do tend to feel you're going to be supported, like something good will happen. Um, we have to believe if we believe in something higher, right, that we're going to be supported when we make uh, the right choice. So, um, so I would leave them with that. I think it's incredibly encouraging to see the bravery of the young folks in the streets, the old folks who are still banging it out. Um, there's a lot of people in this country doing really important work. And I think that we have to take heart that, you know, this is an important moment and, a, and an opportunity and a turning point. And it may get darker and more difficult before it gets better. Um, so yeah, creating those collective spaces is gonna be really important. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we are running out of time um, as usual, but Dr. Henze, I'd love for you to answer this question as well. And then once you do that, if you had like any final remarks and then we'll move on to our last two panelists. Thank you. Sure. Well, I, I, I was, you know, when I heard this question, um, I was curious and this might seem like a senseless thing to ask, but I wondered what's the racial uh, background of the person who asked? And the reason why I ask that is because I've known a number of people of color who um, every day is this question. How am I able to stay in my job seeing what I see? It might not be the sterilization of, um, of, of immigrant women, um, but it's the perpetuation of structural racism it's the uh, accumulation of microaggressions that are resulting in adverse health outcomes for patients of color. How am I able to stay in this job and say something without getting fired? And I think that there is um, a lot of risk involved. And Dana's point about how close are you to leaving is I think a valid one. One of the things that I've heard from some of my colleagues of color is, um, who are your allies? How, if you're going to stay in the system, how are you able to, are you doing a power analysis in the system? Have you made alliances with folks who have the power, who, who might be able to protect you uh, or might be able to say something on your behalf if you don't have the power, right? Let's be strategic. Who are the folks in your system that are able to, you're able to align with to create a coalition? There are lots of uh, colleagues of color that I've worked with who've had to think strategically in order to survive, particularly in academia, but I think in other settings as well. So that's the advice I would give. I think in terms of my closing comments, I've been really um, impressed over the past number of months with the number of Facebook Live events and panels and other opportunities that have popped up in which the spotlight has been shown on racism and white supremacy and its consequences. And I've also been maybe not surprised, but saddened at the backlash. Um, some of us might know that recently, even within the federal government, there was a directive um, um, issued that um, limits the um, funding that uh, can go towards tr racial consciousness training, particularly training that talks about white privilege. So any appropriated funds cannot go towards supporting such trainings um, in the federal government. And I think that the backlash needs to be anticipated. It is, so I guess, what are my closing comments? My comments are that um, 
as we work to challenge white supremacy and to try to uh, change the rated R reality of racism to maybe let's hope, um, I don't know, PG-13, um, maybe even G, general admission, wouldn't that be nice? If we're trying to change our culture to that, we need to be prepared for the backlash and we need to figure out how are we able to engage the folks that are disturbed by a racial analysis. And I think this might have something to do with some of the interconnectivity and healing work that Deanna you know, was, was mentioning um, or implying in her comments, but we need to figure out how are we able to, to, to connect with folks um, who are disturbed or even angry or undermining of efforts to challenge white supremacy and to promote racial justice. Yeah, thank you. Um, Deanna, do you have any last thoughts? The only thing I'll say is relationships are really important. Take care of them, build them. Um, uh, George Lipsitz, who's a beautiful scholar on whiteness, um, told me once, you know, white folks can't heal um, by themselves uh, in a vacuum. We have to be engaged with uh, leaders who are people of color. We have to be really in close proximity, um, not because we have a whole lot to offer, but because we have a lot to learn. And, um, and so I just think that we have to start building really authentic relationships. And um, I would say that's the, that's the first step always. And um, the thing that nobody can take from you. So invest in relationships, love each other. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Athey, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, just, I think, you know, I think this has been a good discussion. I think we need to continue to have these. I'm, I'm reading in the chat. Someone said, you know, I was at first concerned about everyone here being white, um, but I continued to listen and I'm glad I did. Um, it's good to hear the truth about white supremacy. So I think that's huge, right? I mean, that's what we're trying to do is to keep this conversation and keep talking about it. And I think let's keep doing it. Um, and, and again, I agree, Deanna's right on with the relationships and authentic relationships with people. And, lear and, and learning, continuing to learn. Yeah, thank you all so much. I'm gonna, um, Ashanti, do you wanna wrap up or do you want me to? You want me to? Well, I, I can do it. Thank you all so much. I really, I, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedules to talk to us and Dr. Henze, I think you're right. This should not be a rated R conversation, but more like a rated G conversation, because you know what? We should be free to talk about race and whiteness. So I'll leave it to you, Julia, but a friendly reminder, please check out the webinar that's starting about COVID-19 and African-Americans. Go ahead, Julia. All right, well, I just want to say thank you all very much um, for your time. And um, Ashanti and I will be working together to plan another webinar about the intersections of whiteness and health. So stay tuned, everybody. Thank you and have a great evening.